Hi everyone, my name is Madison Keevy. I'm a reporter at WATE Channel 6 in Knoxville. Uh, a lot has been said. A few things that stood out to me uh, that were significant uh, was simply that when the blinds went up, uh, his face was not yet covered. Again, uh, as Chris said, that blank stare straight ahead. Um, in that moment, his hands really never moved. Uh, something else I, I noticed as well, uh, his feet, barefoot, uh, also never moved um, as nearly and as noticeably as his hands did um, as almost his upper body was lifted um, and then was down. Something else, um, you know, kind of going into this, we couldn't see much until the blinds, we couldn't see anything uh, until the blinds were open. We could just hear things um, and, you know, that process of Miller being moved into that room, uh, you couldn't tell what was happening when, you just heard the buckling and unbuckling uh, of different you know, parts of the apparatus on the chair. Um, one of the things that, that I thought was significant at the time, that was the first sort of words we heard um, were through the TDOC officers that were with us in our witness room uh, you know, with the phrase Miller cleared. Uh, shortly after that is when those blinds went up. Uh, and again, that process been described for you as well. Um, I will say when uh, his face was, was covered, there was no movement, and after those final words, there was no sound um, that came from him, even between those jolts. Uh, there was a few minutes of waiting uh, after the second jolt uh, to see uh, if there was going to be any movement or sound, uh, and there was not. Uh, again, you know, when the blinds were closed, all we could hear were those sounds of uh, what sounded like, you know, a mop was you know wet um, and the buckling and unbuckling uh, doors opening and closing uh, so a lot of those sounds were really all we heard minus some of those um, you know his last words and some of those announcements uh, that were shared of microphone on microphone off um, and this is for that period of about 15 or, or 20 minutes um, I will say that uh, in in preparation for this so to speak um, in, in talking to different people, uh, lead detective of this case, myself personally speaking, uh, with the family, I, I asked, as you would as a reporter, uh, for a sweeping statement that you might expect uh, from someone who worked a case like this, who was the family or friend of the victim in a case like this, uh, and something that struck me was not a big sweeping statement uh, that came from those individuals, but just uh, to say of the name Lee Standifer, that that's the name that, that should be remembered, being passed along. Um, and, and again, I don't know what I expected when I asked that question, what kind of message I thought would come, uh, but from both those groups, that's always what it came back to was her name. A lot of the time, that's all they would say, well, just live like Lee, um, was what her family, her mother uh, shared with me. And that, I think, in its simplicity sort of sums up um, the experience leading to this. And then, of course, what you've just heard. Any questions? Thank you.